to start, frankly, I'll let uh, Professor Levinson, we call her Little Lev or the Real Lev or the Smarter Lev or the Younger Lev, but she's going to be the moderator. I just want to start by welcoming everyone and saying thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your connection to Loyal. And thank you for many of my students I see from many years ago and all around the country. And I think I've got one from The Hague uh, for joining us. I really wish we could be in person. I look forward to that. But there's lots to talk about, especially now. So I turn it over to Prof Levinson to start out the program. And then we will get started and giving you the information and answering your questions. So I do want to start, but there's been now a couple of requests to hear. Last call for a good time. You bet. Everybody together. I don't care who you're with or even by yourself. One, two, three. Last, Last call, call for a good time. time. Now we're ready. All right. I, I, rem I was one of your students. I met my husband in your class. Uh, I forgive you. And... Uh, <laughs> and... Um, I am very excited to see at least everybody's names. We have one of the nation's experts on all things criminal law and evidence, my friend and mentor, uh, Professor Levinson. And actually, I just wanna say, I don't say that lightly. We are about three blocks away during COVID. We've waved at each other a couple of times. I'm very proudly wearing my birthday scarf from Professor Levinson and I am, so excited that she asked me to do this panel with her. So we're all here today to talk about, um, we thought about adding an expletive to the title, but we opted not to. So we're going to talk about the Department of Justice and Michael Flynn. And since we actually planned this, um, some breaking news, we're also going to talk about Roger Stone. So, um, and as all of you know, Professor Levinson is a former federal prosecutor. And so the perfect person to talk to us about the Department of Justice. And I want to start really basic, which is why is it important to have a Department of Justice with some independence? You know, sometimes that, that basic question is the most important question to ask and to answer. And for all of you, you know that you went into this profession because you believe in justice. Don't forget, folks, you are getting ethics credit for this hour, but I already know your ethical people. What I want is our Justice Department and our country to be ethical as well. So it is important for people to believe in the justice system. It impacts what everybody does and for it to be nonpartisan and to be independent. Now it is true that the Justice Department is part of the executive branch. It is also true that traditionally the president could set some of the priorities for the Justice Department. Where we are going in a different direction, however, is having interference with individual cases, and not just individual cases, but individual cases that implicate perhaps the president himself. That is why it's important to focus on independence. So one more kind of very broad view question. Where have we seen this interference? We're gonna talk about Michael Flynn. We're gonna talk about Roger Stone. Are there other examples that we should be thinking about? Oh, I think there are lots of examples, so we have them, but don't forget in the very beginning when you had the president, you know, belittling and tearing down the Mueller report, a mischaracterization of what the Justice Department was doing, a lot of name calling, pushing out career prosecutors. We have the prosecutor in the Southern District of New York and now the Eastern District of New York. We almost have a purge going on, not just a purge of those in the Justice Department, but those who are responsible for oversight. And that's when you worry about whether you have enough checks on what's going on here. So um, let's begin with perhaps the most infamous example of a lack of check. You just said it's really important that we have these checks. Um, Michael Flynn. Who is he and how did he become part of... There he um, is, my new best friend, not really. So let me tell you the saga of Michael Flynn if you have not been following it that closely. Michael Flynn started out as a Democrat and in fact he served in special ops in Iraq and Afghanistan. He was a lieutenant army general. He was very decorated and Obama made him the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. And he served in that position for a couple of years. 
but it didn't work out so well. Flynn got very cozy with military, Russian military intelligence, and he kept wanting to do more follow-up trips with them. And there was an informant who was worried that Flynn was not only close to Russian intelligence, but to a Russian woman who may have been compromising our intelligence. And as a result, and also because, frankly, he wasn't a particularly good manager, he was described as um, loose with the truth. There were things known as Flynn facts. He was abusive, and he was somebody who shouldn't leave the department. So he was unceremoniously fired in 2014. And when he was forced out, he put together something called the Flynn Intelligence Group with his son, Michael G. And they were paid by companies who had connections to Russia. And in that regard, he was going to gala dinners where he sat next to Putin. He was representing people with Russian ties regarding Turkish entities. He was registered as a foreign agent. He was getting large amounts of money. Uh, it was in that capacity, Jessica, that he became an advisor to the Trump campaign. And he quickly went over in that direction. It was there that, and we can talk about it more, that it drew the attention of people who were worried about Russian interference with our election. So let's go to that place. And I want to say, I apologize for the bad Zoom etiquette of looking all around. I'm trying to uh, woman the chats, the Q&A, and uh, the script, because unlike Professor Levinson, I am not an expert on all of these things. So Let's pick up where you just left off and let's talk about um, the firing of Michael Flynn and how he became a figure in the, or the, fi the kind of second round of firing by Michael Flynn and how he became a figure in the Mueller investigation. Sure. So, you know, to put it in context, when he joined the Trump campaign, he really joined the Trump campaign. He went to meetings at Trump Towers. He was the keynote speaker, you'll remember, at the Republican convention, leading the yes, team, right. lock her up, lock her up. He was sort of the one who was propagating the pizza gate, where there was a pizza parlor doing terrible things to children. And he was overheard on wires. You know, the Intelligence Committee and FBI had wires up on foreign officials. And one of the people that they had the wires up on was the ambassador, Kislyak, from Russia. And they heard, in fact, Flynn talking to him. What led to the real problem was, is that in December, uh, the Obama administration, after the election, decided to impose sanctions on Russia for their interference, because they knew that they had interfered with the election. And they ended up throwing out about 35 different Russian agents. And they were worried, or they, not worried, they anticipated that Russia would do tit for tat and expel American agents. And when that didn't happen, it raised a lot of eyebrows. And they looked into it and had on tape that there had been a conversation between Flynn and Kislev about don't do the tit for tat. We don't want that. And that's basically someone who's not in the current administration interfering with administration policy. And that could be a violation of a statute we call the Logan Act, which we haven't enforced, but it's on the books. And so people were concerned if he's having that type of conversations, by the way, some of those were from Mar-a-Lago. If he's having those conversations, what's going on with regard to the Russian interference? So even though initially it is true that the FBI had sort of decided they weren't going to pursue any case against Flynn, that they didn't have direct evidence, that the uh, Trump campaign was intentionally asking the Russians to do this, they were happy the Russians were interfering and leasing information regarding Hillary Clinton and, and stolen emails. There had been no direct link of the conspiracy. They took another look. And that's when they decided to send some agents to talk to Flynn. Now, by this time, Trump, who had been sworn in, made Flynn the national security advisor. He only lasted in that, I think, like 22 days or something like that. But he was asked by the Vice President Pence, have you had these conversations? And he said, no. And then there was this interview. You wanna know about the interview? 
I want to know everything about the interview. I want to know, uh, I actually want to know a little bit more about the Logan Act too, but yes, let's go to the interview. So on the interview, what happened is the FBI sent in some agents. McCabe was the one who set up the meeting with Flynn on January 24th. And it's true. They didn't advise him lying is a crime. But guess what? Everyone should know, especially if you're the national security advisor, that lying is not the right thing to do and could be a crime. And he declined to have a lawyer. He, he himself. And he sat down and talked to these agents. And what he lied about is that he said he never had any discussions with Kissing. And it was a really stupid lie because they had him on tape. So at that point, the FBI went through the White House and said, you got a problem because the Russians know your guy is lying. They know. And now you've left him in office. And that's why, forgive me, it was 24 days that he was in office that he ended up resigning and an investigation began of what his interaction was with the Russian. And that inter investigation at that time was done by this guy, Bob Mueller. I keep his book with the Bible next to my bed. And we found out a whole lot more about what's going on. Can I just say, I love the visuals. This is so <laughs> much better than next slide. And now this slide with too much text. I'm. And if anybody in the Loyal Administration is watching, I think Professor Levinson needs refills on that color printer ASAP. <laughs> so I already feel like I know so much more than just reading oh, the headlines. Let me tell you more. Let me tell you yes. more. Let me tell everybody more. Because it will help us understand why what has happened in the Flynn case is seriously so disturbing. Uh, the Mueller investigation starts looking at Flynn and his son. And they realized, you know, we all think he was just committing one crime, lying to the government. And that is a crime for all of you thinking of doing it. Don't do it. Doesn't matter whether you're under oath. Doesn't matter whether you're in the grand jury. Lying to any federal agent is a five-year felony. And prosecutors, Vince Farhead, I know you're on this call, use it all the time. But that was a plea deal. They had him dead to rights. And so he came in, he was represented by a Covington and Burling, decent law firm, and they made a deal because the other things they were looking at were money laundering, kidnapping plot for a Turkish cleric. There was a lot of stuff going on. So Flynn jumped at that one count of a false state of a line, and he was supposed to cooperate. And in fact, he was cooperating. He had something like 17 interviews with the FBI until a trial came up that involves some Turkish folks and whether they were serving as foreign agents. And then he balked. And by that time, some people who were involved in MAGA, that's Make America Great Again, sort of Trump affiliates, had said to his brother, you know, he doesn't really have to do this and we can get him good representation because he had pled guilty. Michael Flynn pled guilty, not once, but twice. He initially pled guilty to Judge Contreras. And in that one, he laid out a long factual basis about what he had done and that he had lied. Then a week later, because Judge Contreras knew some of the FBI agents, including this one, the case was transferred to Judge Sullivan. And Judge Sullivan said, I, I've got to know if you're going to plea. And he pled. And that's when that discussion came up about whether it was treason. It was not to coerce him. It was really saying, you know, what are we talking about here? What's the nature of the conversation? And Flynn pleads guilty again. So it's after he's pled guilty and said he would cooperate and it's time for sentencing. And the government had really, Mullah had recommended that he get a very light sentence at that point that he pulls out. And he tries to withdraw his plea. But Judge uh, Henderson never decides that motion because the White House steps in instead through the Attorney General, and this guy, Barr, who files a very unusual motion, a motion for to um, uh, dismiss the case. And he filed it under Rule 48A. And that rule says that the, the government can move to dismiss with leave of the court. Now, the judge was very concerned. What's going on here? 
when you have somebody who has pled guilty twice and now wants, they want to dismiss the case, the word from the White House and the Justice Department that was filed with the judge was, well, because the FBI was terribly unfair. But that brings us back to the very beginning of the saga. I held it back. Flynn was the guy where the president met with Jim Comey in the Oval Office and said, Flynn's a good guy. Could you see your way to let this go, right? Could you see the way? And when they didn't let it go, fast forward to where they were now, marching towards sentencing, is when Barr stepped in and he ordered an investigation of the investigation. And in doing so, he used some newly acting appointed U.S. attorneys. You know, it's very rare when you have career prosecutors who are quitting cases, but that was happening. And this new prosecutor came in and said, the FBI wasn't fair. They didn't tell him lying was a crime, that uh, they had initially said they would drop it. And those were the reasons given to Judge Henderson to dismiss the case. Now, Judge Henderson wasn't particularly satisfied with those reasons, reaching down. So he asked this gentleman, John Gleason, who's a former federal judge and a former federal prosecutor, to file something with the court as a friend of the court, because the Justice Department wasn't going to challenge their own decision, and the defendant was thrilled. But the court felt that this involved the court and put the stamp of approval of a of justice on it and wanted to have a hearing. Now, at that point, something amazing happened. Flynn files for a writ of mandamus. And as you all know, that's extremely rare. You know, interfering in the middle of a case before there's ever been a hearing to say to the appellate court, order Judge Henderson to dismiss this case and not to even listen to this guy. Um, and I listened to the argument, and um, this was who represented Flynn at the time, um, and she made one of the more remarkable arguments. Her name's Sydney Powell, and her argument, and she's written a book called License to Lie. Um, she, uh, she was asked during an argument, like, where is the evidence to support this? And, and something I want to caution all my former students and non-students to never do in court, she actually said to the judges, we have evidence up the wazoo, a phrase that when I was clerking and have argued cases I've never heard before. That didn't seem to turn off that particular panel because there were two conservative appointments. One Rao appointment, the Judge Rao had been appointed, Naomi Rao, by President Trump to the court. And she and the other um, uh, conservative judge issued a writ of mandamus with a dissent by Judge Wilkins, the Democrat. And she basically sent it down and said, you've got to dismiss this case without a hearing. Where things stand now, Jessica, and I'll shut up, is that there's been a petition for rehearing on bond. Because if you look at the overall composition of the DC circuit, there are still more Democrats on it than conservatives. So depending on what happens there, Flynn's case may or may not go back for, to the trial court to expose what's going on as to why it would be legit to dismiss this case. Um, I can't believe how efficiently you did our <laughs> that <laughs> program with all of those visuals. And so, you know, where have we been? We walked through who Michael Flynn is, why he became important for the Trump campaign, what specifically, and I think this is so interesting, what he could have been charged with, what all of the other issues. Uh, yeah, I think, I think there's a real story there about his interactions with the Turks, because that's where his cooperation fell apart. And we haven't heard much about that in the news, right? So, and in terms of his contacts with the Russians, uh, we didn't hear much about that either. Giving him a plea to a 1001 count, the false statement count, was a really fast, quick, easy way for him to get out of the case. 
There is much more that Mueller saw about this, but we all know how Attorney General Barr characterized the Mueller report, right? He, they, they made it seem like a clean bill of health. And, you know, I, I don't read it that way. I don't think any of us should read it that way. So what, I mean, is it just fair to say that Attorney General Barr blatantly mischaracterized the Mueller report specifically with respect to Flynn? Well, you know, here's what I would say. I can't find his picture because I think I purged it at this point. Oh, he's back. Um, you know, I have to admit that when they first talked about putting Bill Barr into that position, I didn't think it would be a problem. I didn't think it'd be so bad. You know, he has served before. He never showed this side of sort of blind loyalty, really blind loyalty to a president. He had always sort of been committed to the Justice Department, and there are wonderful people in the Justice Department. There's one particular prosecutor I will shout out by name. Oh, that's my daughter. Anyways, um, you know, these are people day in and day out who don't want to be unfair. They want to do the fair things. But Barr does seem to fall in line with this power of the executive. And Jessica, I know you, you've thought about this, which is when it comes to separation of powers, the way Barr seems to see it is that the executive, the president, is a separate but higher power in our, in our governmental state. Not only controlling the decisions on strategy, but on individual cases. And we'll see that when we get to the Roger Stone Act. So what do you think happened to Attorney General Barr? I mean, maybe this isn't a fair question, but I had the same feeling when he was nominated, which is, oh, he's done this before. He was, in fact, the Attorney General, and he's a conservative and he's a Republican, but he seems to take the office seriously. And I didn't predict that, and this is just my own view, not that of Loyola or even maybe, uh, the senior Professor Levinson, that He's been an enormously effective advocate for President Trump, but not necessarily for the American people. It, Did you just call me the senior professor? Thank not you. Not senior. Um, ignoring that, um, I don't really know. Now, many of you know me know that I'm not really a political person. That's the person in the other screen that you're looking at. That I am somebody, a nerdy law professor, proud of it, proud of my, I've had over 10,000 students now, folks proud of all of you. Uh, but I don't really understand politics, and I particularly don't understand when prosecutors engage in politics. Because they have, when we were sworn in, and I was a federal prosecutor, we're sworn in to uphold the Constitution. I don't represent the president. The president, in fact, has lots of his own lawyers. I mean, this president has tons of lawyers. So I don't really know what's going on with Barr. Um, and he might have very genuinely thought that the Mueller investigation went too far, bought into the whole scenario that we've got a witch hunt going on here. If it is a witch hunt, there were an awful lot of kettles to look into because the details, are, you know, this is like a choral reading in our house. Um, not to just sort of fume over Trump. I'm not playing the politics here but to really understand what's happening in government. And, you know, the, the next part of our tale, we'll talk about Congress. It, it is very much Congress's job to keep an eye on this. Um, and I see someone's putting up a uh, liberal perspective, some very left liberal perspective. Um, I understand the concerns and criticisms here. I'm gonna try to stick to the facts, but in some ways the facts are all you need to be disturbed whether you're conservative or liberal, about what's happening, quote, to the rule of law. That is a phrase that people are using. That's the phrase that concerns me. Yeah, and that, um, it actually is written to, for, uh, it's the spelling of my last name, so I'll take the hit on that. I am um, much more political, and I walked uh, Professor Levinson, uh, the more respected, into that particular question. And let me remind everybody, actually, if you have a question for us, please put it in the Q&A. I see Tyler has a hand up. If you have any question because we don't have any way of calling on you, please go ahead. I wish I did. I really wish I did. But I, I see a question here about sort of retaliation. 
against witnesses. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. That relates somewhat to what's happening in the Stone case. Um, without pushing it, can I jump to Stone? Because I think this is a tale both gets told in continuation. So Flynn is out there, and that's outstanding. Uh, I've never met Mike Flynn. I don't know, you know him as a person. What I worry about, honestly, is that his case is being used by people perhaps on both sides. What I really worry about the most is when we go off from ordinary procedures. And in that way, well, maybe this is giving myself too much credit, I feel a little bit like Chief Justice Roberts this term. If you read the court's decisions, he seems to be trying to get the courts back to business as usual, stay on track, don't make special rules just because you're concerned here. But things weren't on the usual track. It is not usual, folks, for a president to ask the head of the FBI to turn the other way on an investigation. Never saw that, right? That's not usual. It's not usual for the government to step up after someone has pled guilty twice and say it's not a crime because the agents maybe should have let this case go. For those of you who practice white collar crime, you will know to a certainty that that does not affect materiality under the statute. So it very much concerns me on a legal basis how this is affecting what will happen in other cases. If you are doing a case right now and you have an individual who's charged with a 1001, a false statement or something like this, I think you almost have an ethical duty to make a request to the prosecution of all discovery, not just of witnesses, but the internal operations of the investigation. Because if it works for Flynn to argue that the FBI wasn't doing things in the way they should have, why shouldn't it work for your client? And that's what I mean by the fact that big profile cases can trickle down and affect other cases in the court, and the judges are concerned. And let me make something, I think I speak for both of us when I say, um, we are talking about whether or not whoever is in the Oval Office should have this power. We are talking about whoever is the Attorney General should have this power. For me, and I know that this sounds political, but I really believe we would be saying exactly the same thing if it were a Democratic president who was saying to the director of the FBI, I hope you'll find it within yourself to you know, look favorably on my former national security advisor. Um, or if it was a Democratic attorney general who was saying, and I just want to emphasize that you've used this word a couple of times, that it's unusual, that it's somewhat extraordinary for the attorney general um, to say, let's take a different tact. And this is something I actually want to um, yeah, and, and there's a question. I, I, I am reading chats and reading your lips and everything else. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Miller Bogdanos has asked, how does FISA abuse come into play here? Yeah, there have been allegations that the FISA court, if you don't know what the FISA court is, it's the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Uh, I would tell you more about it, but it's secret. No, um, it is a court that issues surveillance. Uh, and there have been problems and allegations in the warrants. And those are worth investigating, no question about it. But none of that actually changes the fact that Flynn lied. So, you know, he didn't seek suppression or, you know, well, that's not what we're talking about, like the Fourth Amendment, and let's suppress the evidence. Um, this is a situation where he lied and he didn't, it, it doesn't really involve whatever was taped before because they had other information that he did lie. And even on those tapes, they weren't thrown out. So wanted to get to that point. Um, since you're doing all the heavy lifting, would you like me to? Uh, no, I'm hopping right into at our next time. At you least know. try and uh, look at the Q and A. All right. So our next act. Are you? You want to do Act Two, and then we'll do more of the Q and A. We're going to do Act Two because where he's up, I think. What do you think? All right. So let's begin. Or Let's continue with Roger Stone and talk about what he was charged with and why. Okay. Well, let me give you a little background. If you don't know Roger Stone 
and I didn't just pick out a picture to you know grab your attention. It's actually if you go and Google this guy, this is what he usually looks like wearing these glasses. Um, he also often looks like this. This was him sort of doing the Nixon victory sign. That was right after he got indicted. He did that when he was indicted. He did that when he was found guilty. He is his own person. So let me tell you a bit about Roger Stone. He is a friend of President Trump. I'm not being political in saying that, but I'm being factual. He's also been a political consultant and a lobbyist, and he's worked on campaigns. He's worked on Nixon, Reagan, Trump, and others. He co-founded a lobbying firm with a fellow by the name of Paul Manafort, maybe that name you recall. And he is a self-proclaimed, he doesn't see this as a slight. This is his calling card, a self-proclaimed dirty trickster. He embraced and boasted what happened in the Nixon campaign. And you know the information that was leaked and the dirty tricks that were played. He saw himself as somebody who could continue to play that role. And he was not embarrassed by it. He was not ashamed of it. He embraced it. And you might be familiar with some of the dirty tricks that he has done. For those of you who remember the Dukakis campaign, he was the person who came up with the Willie Horton campaign to scare people into that Dukakis had granted some pardons. He also got involved in the George H.W. Bush campaign. I don't think President Bush called on him to do this. I think he is sort of the lone wolf sometimes wanting to get credit for doing these things. But he, uh, uh, he was involved in that. He went after Elliot Spitzer, really didn't like Elliot Spitzer, to the point, and he's not subtle in how he does these dirty tricks. He actually called up Elliot Spitzer's 83-year-old father and threatened him bodily to get him to try to implicate his son. Um, so that's who he is. And he joined up with the Trump campaign, but he did leave under some controversy. And initially, President Trump called him a, quote, stone cold loser. But they clearly mended fences. And they brought him back in as an informal advisor. And I don't really know what an informal advisor is, but President Trump referred to him as a good guy, so loyal. And he continued dirty tricks throughout the 2016 campaign you might recall the one where he went after Ted Cruz and accused him of having five extramarital uh, affairs without doing it directly, just when he's asked by the news, saying, oh, yes, everybody's talking about that, right? And that keeps it in the news cycle. So it also came out during the 2016 campaign that he was boasting about his role in being able to collaborate with WikiLeaks uh, founder Julian Assange about the leaks to discredit Hillary Clinton with her emails and other emails. And what the intelligence community very much knew and was shown to be true is that was propagated by the Russians. You know, for those of us who think that there was not Russian interference, that is settled. There was Russian interference. The question is, who brought it on, who benefited, but that happened. And so he was the one basically saying, you know, I know that there are going to be many more stolen emails that are coming out. Wait for it, wait for it. We got more to go after Hillary Clinton. Um, and he seemed to have a web of contacts with the Russian officials who might be responsible. They did it through Facebook. They threw it through blogging. And then when it was done, the election was done, that became a target of the Mueller investigation. Now, it wasn't just the Mueller investigation, right, Jessica, because there were congressional investigations into this. I'm not talking about the impeachment hearing. I'm talking about congressional committees whose job it is to look at these things. And they had hearings into the Russian interference. And Stone and others were supposed to be witnesses because they had heard and he had bragged about the Russian interference. But at that point, he started doing other things, like lying. He lied to the congressional committee saying that um, he doesn't know anything about it. He doesn't have a single email or text that relates to communications regarding the Russians. 
it's a silly thing to do that when they do a search and they find just literally reams of emails and texts that he had boasting about these things. But he went beyond that. He went to telling witnesses, uh, Randy Credico, is that how he pronounced it? Yes. Um, that quote, uh, trying to get him not to testify. So when we complain about Congress not doing its job, there's plenty to complain about there, but it's also a problem when you have people intentionally interfering with witnesses. And so he told Credico, if you testify, you're a fool. He made threats. He called him a rat, a stoolie. And he said, prepare to die, you words I cannot say on the screen. Begins with a C, and the second word begins with an S and ends with an R. And so if you're over 18, you can say it to yourself. So he, um, he made these threats, and he impeded that investigation. And Jessica, that is what led to the charges against Roger Stone. Um, uh, do you want to know more about those? I, I do, and I want to pause for a second. Can you explain why these charges are so important? So we hear, and you touched on it, we hear a lot about, oh, that's just a process crime. And why does obstruction of a congressional investigation, obstruction of justice, these aren't just process crimes because they prevent us from being able to do what? Well, I think they prevent us from preventing this, uh, you know, ha having this happen again. I, I don't care what side of the political aisle you're on. We are all dedicated to having fair elections, yes. And fair elections by Americans, not by Russians, right? And so I think the real problem here is people see Congress as just a body that's going after the president. They have a separate duty to ensure that this doesn't happen again. What fools would we be if basically we didn't look into this and take whatever precautions? I'm not sure you can prevent this. You know, Jessica, I'm not sure totally, but you can at least try to figure out what happened. And that in fact was with both a House committee and a Senate committee we're trying to do. Right. So uh, no, Roger Stone um, goes ahead and lies, interferes with a witness, and obstructs justice. Visual. Yeah, my house is papered in indictments. And this is the one against Roger Stone. There were seven felonies that he was charged with in January of 2019. The FBI's did that big raid of his Fort Lauderdale house, you might remember, like, Good morning, and there are 29 FBI agents on your lawn. Not a good day. Um, and Sorry. Stone, who is not, you know, he's not a cautious guy. He starts name-calling the prosecutor. Um, now, he's lucky it's Bob Mueller, because I don't think Bob Mueller gets personally upset about those things. He does get upset when people misrepresent him or attack his people, which is what we saw this week. But, you know, he's got Teflon. He's been a government public servant for so long. Nonetheless, he has his people look into what happened here. And, they, and the grand jury, not by Mueller, the grand jury indicts Roger Stone. And he gets a trial set before uh, Judge Amy Berman Jackson. Now, he does some things that are remarkable during that trial. Um, I was going to grab a picture of it, but I decided I didn't want to put that out there anymore. He takes a picture of the judge yeah. with a target crosshair on her forehead and puts that out on social media. Um, I consider that very dangerous and irresponsible and unfair to the judges who are trying to do their job. He talks to the press. She has to deal with putting on a gag order and having a fair trial. They have a trial. He is convicted by a jury. And the ju he then challenges on a motion for a new trial. One of his challenges on a motion for a new trial is that he said he didn't get a fair trial because the four person didn't like President Trump. And the judge seriously considered this and went through the entire voir dire and all the statements and said, no, I, you know, I am the opportunity to use peremptory challenges and the like. And and dismiss, decline the motion for a new trial. And um, at that point, the career prosecutors on the case were seeking a seven to nine year sentence. Now, that is pretty long for lying. That is pretty long for interfering, but 
in truth, we don't do that many obstruction of justice cases of these facts. But those prosecutors thought, given the nature of his behavior, and given how unrepentant he was, that that was the appropriate sentence. At that point, Trump said, this is terribly unfair, he's a good guy, and Barr steps in and gets involved and basically assigns another new prosecutor, Tim Shea, an acting U.S. attorney, to take a look at it, and he submits, career prosecutors quit, uh, or move to other departments, and he submits a revised sentencing memo for a lighter sentence. Although I don't think they called for a specific number, just saying lighter. And in fact, the judge does give a lighter sentence. She only imposes a 40 month sentence. Um, as you all know, Stone was supposed to report to prison this coming week, with or without sunglasses. Uh, but at the last minute, and I knew that he was going to get clemency when I heard that he was no longer seeking a delay of his sentence. Originally, he was seeking a delay, and we thought it was COVID-driven, but when he said, I'm not, then I said, well, it's coming. And what's common is, you know, people call it a pardon, but it's not a pardon, and that's going to be important for reasons I'll tell you. Clemency by the president. The president has that power. It is a leftover from sovereign power of a king or a queen as the head to say, I don't care what the jury said, I don't care what justice says, I'm giving the guy a break. But there are two different breaks, folks. There's pardon and there's commutation. Pardon means you don't have the conviction anymore. It's clean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna give you that break. Commutation, which is much more, you, happens more frequently, is you don't have to serve your punishment. And for Stone, and this had to be clarified this week, he doesn't have to go to prison. He doesn't have to pay his fine. He doesn't even have to be subject to supervised release. So you're saying, well, okay, at least the president didn't go all the way to a pardon. And some of the people that President Trump have commuted um, have raised my eyebrows. Uh, Rod Blagojevich, do you remember he was the guy in Illinois who was selling a senator seat? Uh, Michael Milken, wow. If you don't remember him, thank God you're younger than me. Uh, Joe Arpaio, the sheriff and his contempt course, Michael Flynn. So there's been a pattern. Now, it is true, presidents tend to pardon or commute the sentences of their friend. Clinton did this. You know, Obama pardoned, not on this level, but did pardon people. But what worried people here is that the way it was done and the implications of it. Because the concern is, is that, in fact, Stone one of the things that he was being asked to testify about was the Russian interference. And the House was trying to get down to whether people at the highest levels, including the president, were embracing this, encouraging it, or raging it. But if you can shut down Stone, you don't get that information. And so the president is commuting the sentence of somebody who could, hypothetically, be a witness against him. And he's doing it in a very clever way. Do you want to know? No, I think we're good. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, if you get a pardon, you no longer have any charges, you no longer have any Fifth Amendment rights. You can be forced to say anything. Right. But Stone is still appealing his sentence. And you have a Fifth Amendment right through appeal. So he can stay quiet under the Fifth Amendment and still get the benefit of the commutation. And that's where we are now. Now, there are ways around that. I mean, tough prosecutors, tough prosecutors would jam him into the grand jury and give him use immunity and he wouldn't be covered. But it does throw sort of a monkey wrench into where you go. And the other thing is, who's ever really gonna believe much of what Roger Stone has to say? So where we are now, and my concern is this, is how much the American public can trust the Justice Department. And here, I can't really blame, well, maybe a little bit, this guy. This guy 
said that he thought that the conviction of Stone was righteous and that the sentence was fair. That's what he said before the commutation. He hasn't said anything since the president commuted. Uh, you did a lot of heavy lifting for this panel, Professor Levinson. So I have some other questions, but I do want to get to and remind everybody um, that you know the Q and A box is open. This people are getting credit for talking about for us talking about the ethics behind this. So can you talk to us a little bit? Give us the, if you don't mind, the MCLE ethics portion of. Um, what the attorneys were doing here, and while you're talking, I, I don't know that you and I have ever talked about this, but I'd love to hear you address it. Have you ever seen this division in the Department of Justice, either when you were part of the Department of Justice or watching it later, between the career politicians, excuse me, the career public servants and the appointed members of the Department of Justice? And have we ever seen this many, this number of people pulling out of cases? Yeah. or just resigning the yeah. department, period? Not so much. I mean, there have been tumultuous times in the Justice Department. During the Nixon Watergate investigation, yes, that was a tumultuous time, but you didn't see this type of division necessarily. Uh, I actually testified in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee when Bush was firing some career U.S. attorneys, and I think he indirectly didn't like what they were doing on cases, but nothing at this scope. And that relates to ethics of all lawyers and particularly ethics of prosecutors. You know, prosecutors have a heightened duty. I see a question that came in about like exculpatory evidence. That is one of the duties prosecutors have is to turn over exculpatory evidence. I don't know that the FBI withheld evidence that showed people were innocent. I think they did withhold that their internal decision-making process was questioning whether they had enough to go on, but people will debate whether that's the same as showing that somebody's innocent or impeachment. But prosecutors do have to step back and say, their client is the American people. Their client is justice. And I worry a lot, almost like some of the chat I see going on here, that we're mistaking what we do as lawyers with what the political battle is that's going on. Thank you. So. Um I have about 45 minutes worth of additional questions, but I think we promised everybody that we would be off fairly soon. So I do want to get to some more of the Q&A. Um, there are two questions that are essentially, I think, asking similar issues, which um, one of them is, um, does the withdrawal of the indictment by the Department of Justice create a bar, pun intended, thank you, Carl, for refiling by a subsequent administration. And this was, uh, this came in at 1225. So this is with respect to the Flynn uh, discussion. So it's the motion to dismiss, right. That is a great question, Carl. I see who sent it in. Uh, so it's a motion to dismiss. A motion to dismiss with prejudice probably will bar under the rule 48 if it's without prejudice. Now, the very odd thing here is that, you know, you have an appellate court sending it back to a district court and not even giving it an opportunity to have a hearing to say how it should be dismissed. Um, and so I think we need to assume that there would be some kind of bar, but not at all clear and. Great question, Carl. It might be a bar to the reprosecution on the 1001, but to the extent that a subsequent investigation by a new administration might go into those dealings with Turkey, might go into some of the money laundering issues. Those wouldn't necessarily be blocked. I think that's Marge Erickson's question about whether or not Flynn could be prosecuted for other crimes or are they, um, are they barred? I have to say I'm a little bit disappointed that I wasn't the one to think of that pun, but I appreciate that from everybody. <laughs> and- um, We call you the more clever Levinson. I think everybody listening knows that absolutely nobody has ever called me that, but I, I appreciate that very much. Um, Carl asked a follow-up that I think um, is so interesting. I'll give, can, parallel to my prior question, can a subsequent president withdraw the commutation? No, I don't think so, they can. Actually, I don't think they can. And there's much discussion, you might know it better, Jessica, 
about whether we could even have statutes that revise commutation. I don't think so. I think it's probably unconstitutional in the nature of the office. I do think we could ask, have laws that require reporting to Congress, reports on them, notice, things like that. But no, um, when you vote for somebody, this is part of the power that they will have when you vote for them. If anything, what we've seen over the last uh, three and a half years, and frankly, three and a half decades, is that the executive has enormous power. Enormous and power. It depends on who's in the Oval Office as to how much they're comfortable exercising it, but we've certainly seen that this crosses party aisles. And, you know, of our three branches, the executive branch kind of, it, like, continues to expand and expand when it comes that to... That is actually part of Barr's philosophy. He believes in sort of that bigger executive branch. Um, this is my own follow-up. Can the commutation, even if the president has broad power to commute a sentence, and the president also has broad power to, for instance, fire the director of the FBI. But the question was, um, in both cases, can you do so in a way that would actually give rise to obstruction of justice? So I have my laptop here. This is not the one Loyola gave me. I have the power to set it on fire if I want. But if there's evidence on here that the FBI might want, all of a sudden I can't set the laptop on fire. Don't so, set your laptop on fire. Also, you'll see that you're close enough that you'll see the smoke and that will really disturb you. It, can the commutation itself give rise to a crime? Is it an open yeah. legal question? I think it's an open question. I actually think it was one of the big problems with the impeachment proceedings. And it's interesting. We all seem to have forgotten about that. But in the impeachment proceedings, they were claiming that some of the things the president did under the president's power were obstruction. And I think that people are concerned. You know, they don't want presidents to obstruct, but they don't want to cut back on presidential power. So to answer your question, one of those really key open questions. Anybody out there can write that law review article. Amy Spencer asks a follow-up question, uh, which is, and I think the answer is this is another open question because we've never tested this. Does the president have the power to pardon himself? Uh, well, you know, Amy Spencer is one of the smartest people in the universe. Hi, Amy. Um, and I think you're in New Hampshire now, too. Uh, you're all the smartest people. To answer your question, we don't know the answer. You know, it hasn't been done. Ford did pardon Nixon, and that's what happened. Um, and I think it was, you know, frankly, a political accommodation to help the nation move forward. It boggles my mind we're actually talking about a situation where a president might try to pardon himself. Um, because I don't think that's usually what the American public thinks about when they elect somebody to office. Are we electing somebody who would put their interests so far ahead? Now, I thought the question might be, can the president be charged? Uh, with any crimes, and we all know that there's an internal policy. I, I'm not actually sure that it's accurate under the law. There's even debate on that, that a sitting president cannot be charged and tried. But one of the reasons it was a significant decision about the subpoenas in the New York grand jury, and we'll have a subsequent program on that in weeks to come, is because absolutely there could be charges on all sorts of things if the evidence supported it after the presidency is done. Yeah, um, that was the, you're, you're of course referring to the Vance case that came out um, in COVID times about seven years ago, but I think in real time about five days ago. I think that was just last Thursday uh, that the Supreme Court decided the, the Vance case. Jessica, I'm going to jump up in real quickly because I, I see some of the questions and I just want to answer them real fast and then you can get to your next favorite one. The question one was, was the last time someone was actually prosecuted under the Logan Act? They weren't. You know, we've got a law in the book and maybe we should be thinking about how that law is used because if people are now making representations about our foreign affairs, how interested are we on that? Exculpatory evidence, yes, I think I answered this. Um, I, we have somebody who asked, what does the pattern of corrupt, uh, corruption and conflict of interest do the public's trust? You, can, you all have your opinions on this. Do you need a conviction in order to grant a pardon? You, Jessica, answer that one. No. Uh, see, for example, President Ford and President Nixon. 
Yeah, you don't. You actually don't need that. Okay. Um, and then there's a question by someone at CSUF. Didn't the FBI alter the 302s at the direction of McCabe? Uh, let me address that individual. As a federal prosecutor, I will tell you this. It is absolutely standard practice that they're making multiple 302s regarding an occasion. We've all sat in on interviews and seen things differently. So we need to be very careful when we buy into any theories out there that there was tampering of evidence. There are people in the FBI who clearly did not like or trust Trump. But as an institution, my experience was very positive working with the FBI. Overwhelmingly, the men and women in the FBI are professionals. And, you know, maybe they're not at the, you know, the level you're looking at. But I worry a lot in this discussion, we cast aspersions on some of the most important institutions that are safeguarding us in America. Um, thank you for blasting through those questions. So, and that Logan Act question was from uh, one of my first former students, Max. Hi, thank you for asking that question. And so we have a couple of questions left, but uh, we're at 1256. So I think what we could do is try and maybe post some answers if you want, Professor Levinson, or do you want to uh, try and run through a few more of them? Let's, you know, if you see questions, let's run through them and then I'll just sort of sum things up and invite you to reach me offline from this particular program. So, all right. The last question. Um, so, uh, Susan White asks a question, says that we're focusing on pleading guilty, but innocent people plead guilty. Susan, um, th yeah, Susan, thank you for that question. And I want to share something with all of you right now. Um, if you don't know what I'm doing lately, I run Loyola's Project for the Innocent. I am insanely proud of our team and of Loyola. We have a client right now who's innocent and sitting in San Quentin. He has been there 18 years. He was convicted when he was 15 and he has now contracted COVID. And you know, he didn't plead guilty, but there are people who plead guilty all the time. That is one of the reforms that we have to make. In terms of Michael Flynn, whether he pled guilty when he was innocent, I have a high degree of confidence that he was not innocent. And I want to tell you why. Because he pled guilty not once, but twice. He laid out an extensive factual basis for his plea. He stood up in court and said it, um, and was questioned, pushed on it. That's one of the things Judge Henderson said, you know, like, I don't want this to happen if you didn't do it, you know? Uh, and he stood by his plea. So, I do think one of the things we need to take as a serious reform is making sure all pleas are more like this, where defendants are given an opportunity to say, I'm only pleading because I don't have any choice. They're going to go after my kid or something like that, as opposed to what did you do? Lay it out there. And that's why one of the things Judge Henderson wanted to look at in this Rule 48 hearing is whether Flynn had lied under oath and whether that in itself is contempt in a way to say we need to take these basic procedures seriously, or people will always question like they are now. All right. With that, at 12.59, let me say, Professor Levinson, I always learn something. I always learn more than one thing. Uh, I always have a little bit of PTSD. I worry that I'm going to hear those words, Levinson, on your feet, because <laughs> I think I heard that every single day of evidence fall 2003. I also want to say, and you're going to be angry at me for saying this, um, I'm so glad that you are part of the legal system. You are one of the people who I constantly look to because you care so much about upholding the system on both sides. And I've, I know that you worked as a prosecutor. I know you lead the charge for the Project for the Innocent. This is one of the things that loyalists should be proudest about. This is who we are. This is what you do for the rest of us. I know I'm going to get a call in 30 seconds that you're very no, angry. No, you're again. going to get me cutting you off right now. People don't hang up until I say this. Jessica Levinson is the real thing. And she didn't get as much a chance to talk this time because I'm a loud mouth. But you can watch her on television pretty much every Sunday. She is the go-to person in the upcoming election issues. She is an election expert like none others. And I am so lucky 
to be able to call her my colleague and my friend. And you, I hope, appreciate what Loyola has in Jessica Levinson. So well, thank you all for spending an hour and stay healthy, folks. You know, wear the mask. I even wear it at my desk just as a good reminder. Um, call me or email me if you have ongoing questions. Uh, just caring about this fulfills your ethical rules. You need this for your MCLE, so I'm putting it on online. Don't assist with a violation of the law. Don't be involved in a conflict of interest. If you're an advisor to a client, remember that you're an officer of the court. Remember that you cannot raise claims that are not supported by a good faith basis. Don't communicate with people who are represented by lawyers, even if you don't think much of their lawyers. Don't solicit clients, even though you think you'd be so much better than the one who's representing them. And overall, there are many types of misconduct. Think about it. Stop it. Report. All right. On that note, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, thank you for making my job so easy. I think I asked four questions and then you took it from there. I loved the visuals. I loved the information. Um, I love that you care deeply about these issues. And thank you so much to all the people for the comments. We'll try, if they're unanswered questions, we'll try and get to it. And on that note, uh, Maya, do you want to play us out or do we just wait? Um, Maya? I'll get it started. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Be well, be safe. That's very, very important. Thanks, everybody. Bye.